past 18 years. And since 1995, I have been involved in the decipherment of the carbonized papyrus rolls that were found in the Byzantine church in Petra. In the past two years, um, including this year, of course, um, I will have with me one of my collaborators, Terry Szymanski, who is sitting right here in front of us. Terry is a graduate student at the University of Michigan, and one of the things that he has been doing for us, which is invaluable work, is that he does a lot of the digital conservation and restoration that is needed for this papyri. As you will see from the talk, many of the papyri have survived to us in very fragmentary condition, and many fragments are out of place. Now, we don't want to touch this material because it's very fragile, so instead what we do is a virtual reconstruction on the computer. We use a program called Adobe Photoshop, and we shift the fragments around until we get text that makes sense, and at that point we get confirmation that in fact we do have the fragments in the right place. Um, I'm very privileged to be here tonight and to give this lecture in the context of this extremely amazing exhibition out of the desert, right? Is that what it's called? Um, which was put together by our hostess tonight, uh, Madame Shoma and Patricia Bikai and a bunch of other people. It's really, um, I didn't have to spend very much time in the exhibition, it was only 10, 15 minutes, but it's really amazing. It is as if you're walking in the past. It's a very postmodern approach to archaeology, where archaeology turns into art and art into archaeology. It's really, um, it's really uh, an exhibition worth visiting and bringing also your friends and also your children, because I think it's very important to teach the next generation uh, what all these artifacts mean in terms of the cultural heritage of Jordan. And of course the papyri are part of this exhibition, and in particular inventory 10, as we call it now, we have renamed the Khaled and Stuka Shaman papyrus, which was adopted several years ago. That was a very generous move on behalf of the Shaman family, because this project needs support, as many other archaeological projects do too. And it is very important to have people who are not necessarily professional archaeologists but who care about cultural heritage to be deeply involved and also support financially this kind of project. Um, I also heard that it was probably about five years ago when Khaled passed away, and I would like to dedicate this lecture tonight to his memory. Um, the historical period we'll be looking at tonight is from approximately 514 to 595 of the Common Era. Um, and we will focus primarily on this one papyrus, which is very important for the history of Petra and its region. But of course, we need to do that within a broader context. So I will do a bunch of different things before I get into the text. I'll give you a little crash course on what papyrus is, papyrology, the historical period, what happens in the broader empire, the discovery of the papyri, the conservation of the papyri, and eventually I will get to the uh, Shoman papyrus. So basically, I'll be covering an area of about 80 years, but I will be looking at very specific things, mostly the nature of the economy and the culture of Petra as this emerges through this particular papyrus and the general archive. The lecture will be about 50 minutes long. If you get bored, do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, just a few basic things here. What is papyrus <coughs> and what is papyrology? And what is a papyrologist? I'm a papyrologist. I'm the person who studies the papyrus. Papyrus, is, was the primary writing material in the ancient world. It is a plant that grows along the Nile in Egypt, and paper is made out of the stalks of the papyrus. It's a very tedious, time-consuming process, 
and the Egyptians maintained the monopoly of the papyrus throughout the ancient world. There were other writing surfaces in the ancient world, pot charts, which we call ostraca, wax tablets, tablets, wooden tablets, um, lead, and parchment. Parchment, which is made out of animal skin. So papyrus actually refers to two different things, the plant that grows along the Nile, and also the paper that is made out of it. And as I said, it was the main medium for recording, not only literature, but also everything. Documents. Now, although the virus was used throughout the Mediterranean days and then beyond for recording literature and documents, it survived primarily in the dry climates of Egypt, in the rubble of ancient cities, and in the desert. Outside of Egypt, it has survived in its original form in places like Messana, Dura Europos, and a few other places. But where else it has survived? It survived in a carbonized form, like the carbonized papyri we have from the Petra Church, and also the famous papyri from Herculaneum in Italy, when the Zubis erupted, the entire city was covered, and the papyri that were in that particular site got carbonized. Carbonized papyri has survived also in Egypt, uh, and that's mostly in the region of the Delta of the Nile where, in fact, papyrus has not survived in its original form because papyrus is a perishable material in this place. Okay. So the find in Petra is really a complete accident, an accident of nature, an accident of elements. And if papyrus were not recognized, they would never have survived. Now, papyrologists are scholars who study basically writing a papyri that is in Greek and Latin. We don't study, for instance, Egyptian scripts, that's for Egyptologists, Coptic is studied by Copticists, and in the last 10 or 15 years, there's a new rising field, the field of Arabic papyrology, where not much work has been done, and of course it's a fascinating period, because we had a transition from the Byzantine to the Muslim era, and as I said, it's only in the last 10 or 15 years that serious work has been happening. Greek, why do we have Greek on the papyri? Well, after the conquest of Alexander the Great, and after his death and the division of his empire into the Hellenistic kingdoms, Greek became the lingua franca of the Mediterranean world. Before Greek became the lingua franca, Aramaic was the previous international language, so to speak. It was the language of the Persian Empire. So gradually, Greek replaced Aramaic as the main language. But that doesn't mean that the local alphabets, the local scripts, and the local dialects that exist in Egypt, in the Near East, everywhere, really disappeared at once. We have a coexistence, both of this big language, this international language, but also of the local scripts. So for the most part, really, people who could read and write, and those were the minority, were probably bilingual. Most of them were monolingual. And perhaps most of them couldn't read and write in either language. The rate of literacy in the ancient world was very high. OK, just a few words on why the pyrite are important. Well, it's self-evident. First of all, the pyrite contain literature of known writers like Homer, Plato, Euripides, you name it. Um, but if they also record literature, this is literature that has survived us, but they also record literature that didn't make it through the medieval tradition. And here we have a famous case of the lyric poetess from the island of Lesbos, Sappho. We have the comedian Menander, we have the Alexander Kalimachus. These writers have survived to us only on the papyrus. There is nothing, there is nothing uh, about them in the later periods. And of course, the papyri record all sorts of everyday documents. And here you can just imagine what kind of documents. Basically, everything we write today, people wrote also in the ancient world from contracts, leases, 
agreements, letters, genres such as curses, oracles, prophecies, medical recipes, etc., etc., etc. So this is just to get a sense of what these papyri are about. Now, with regard to the particular period that um, I'll be talking about today, um, as I said, the period is from about 515 to 595. This is like in the middle of that period. This is the year in which the Emperor Justinian stepped down as Emperor. He was succeeded. And this is exactly the period in which the Byzantine Empire had reached its largest expanse. Uh, Justinian had managed to recapture parts of the Western Empire that were taken over by people from the north. And here you can see the Near East. Petra is part of this empire, it's located somewhere down there. And here you can see the Latvian and Gasly Arabs that are sort of really very close to the border. In fact, the Emperor Justinian had struck deals with the Ghassanid leaders. He had named two of them, in fact, as kings of this area um, in return of certain um, agreements that they had signed, the Arab leaders, and the emperor in Constantinople, in terms of keeping people in control and uh, keeping also the allied, Arab allied tribes in control. All that, of course, 60 or 70 years later changes completely uh, because Petra is no more part of the Byzantine Empire. And here, just to show, to give you an example, what happens a century later, like 100 years after that, you can see that the empire has shrunk really substantially. The entire east has been taken over by the Umayyad Caliphate, where um, I think they were based in Damascus, that's where the seat of the, um, of the Caliphate. And again, you can see part of Greece has been taken over by Slavs. Uh, Bulgars up here, they keep moving down south by the 17th centuries, they take over, and this is where modern Bulgaria now is, right? So these are the tribes that eventually move down there. And of course, uh, also North Africa has been lost, Egypt is not part of the Byzantine Empire anymore. So this is what I have to say in terms of a general context. Now let's turn to Petra gradually. And here, of course, um, we need to start with what we knew about Petra before the excavation of the Byzantine Church and before the empire. <laughs> you can see that you know, here. All right, so in the beginning, I'll start with what we knew before the Holy discoveries. So well, Petra was, as you all know, the capital of the ancient Latin kingdom and was one of the most important commercial centers of the ancient Near East. And here I have a little map that shows to us where Petra is located right down here. The red uh, lines here indicate the trade routes. So you can see that Petra was strategically located in, in the center of trade routes that went from north to south, from east to west. It was a real important center in the um, Nabatean and in the Roman period. The city floors primarily in the first century BC, uh, the BC and the third century AD due to the active Nabatean participation in the overland caravan trade in spices and aromatics between South Arabia and the Mediterranean. The Nabatean kingdom was not conquered by Alexander the Great, never became part of another Hellenistic kingdom, and people remained nomadic until the foundation of the city of Petra in the late Nabatean period, so first century BC. In 106 CE, Petra was annexed and became the capital of the Roman province of Arabia. Little is known about the city after the third century. At the end of the fourth century, a period of extensive but poorly known administrative changes, Petra emerged as the capital of the province of Palestina Sanitaris or Palestina Tertia, Third Palestine. Uh, what was conceived to be Palestine then, in other words, was divided into three administrative units. Now, the Petra papyri is interesting. Inform us that in fact the province was locally known not as Palestina Sanitaris or as Palestina Tertia, but through a combination of titles as Palestina Tertia Sanitaris, combining both titles that we knew before. 
continuing on the, uh, along the same line, again, before all these new excavations in the 1990s, Petra in the fourth century was considered to be really the center of paganism and idolatry, a place of banishment where heretic clerics were being sent en masse. Um, and this, happening, uh, this was happening probably especially in the fifth century CE. The Bishop of Petra belonged to the Patriarchate of Jerusalem after 451. There were, uh, the city was really tormented by a number of earthquakes, and here we mention two important ones because they are visible, very visible in the archaeological record, you can see the damage. One was in 363, uh, the city was really damaged, and you can see repairs in various buildings, and along the aqueduct that we have in the city. And then in 551, another big earthquake, and at that point, the archaeologists had speculated that perhaps that was the end of Petra, and that Petra didn't really exist after 551. However, things changed after the excavations of the early 1990s, with the excavation of the Byzantine Church, and then also the excavation of the Great Temple by Brown University, the discovery of the papyri, and here we have now really a revision, a complete revision of the history of Petra. In the 1990s, um, as I mentioned earlier, excavations were conducted in the Byzantine Church by the American Center for Oriental Research, and they were directed by Dr. Peter Kai. In the course of these excavations, papyri, carbonized papyri, were discovered uh, in, um, in an annex of the church, and I'll get to that in a second. And basically what happened at that stage is that after we started the papyri, we came to realize that the really Petra continued much beyond 551. Um, and in fact, now a fair combination of the archaeological record from the church and from the combination of information from the information, we can have a much better understanding of the Byzantine invasion of Petra. And in fact, we get very intimate glimpses into the everyday life of people. This is not just general information, but we see these people in their everyday activities. What they did, what property they owned, what families they had, what was the culture like in the particular period. And a very familiar sight for you. This is a picture actually that was taken much before the excavations of the Roman shops down here. I think it's the beginning of it. The brown excavation now has revealed much more information much more down here. The church is located exactly opposite the Colonnade Street, really literally exactly opposite uh, the great temple that is being excavated by the ground. And here is the church, a beautiful church with mosaics. I'll get into that in a second. The papyri were excavated right here in this northeast room um, of the church. And here we have a reconstruction. The room is actually marked with the number one and there's no direct access to this room. In fact, when you want to go from the church to the room, you go through this little door here, into room two, and then into room one. And this is the actual room after excavation. If you go now to the church, to the, this particular room, you will not see what I'm trying to point out here, which is the signs left by the fire, right here. This is all actually is gone because of the elements. But you can see here the traces of fire. The early phase of the church dates to the 5th century, but most of what survives last dates to the 6th century. At all likelihood, the church was the seat of the Bishop of Petra, a very important church. And as one of our texts informs us, this is one of the Petra papyri texts, it was dedicated, and I quote here directly from the papyrus, it was dedicated, the church was dedicated to our old holy mistress, the glorious, God-bearing, ever-virgin Mary. And this is clearly Jesus' mother. The church includes standard early Byzantine iconography. It was lavishly decorated with marble and mosaics depicting the four seasons and other naturalistic designs, as well as the gothic landscapes and cornucopia. Here we have what I think it is a scene of cornucopia, a symbol of fertility, plentitude, strong harvests, and abundance. This is a classical motif, it's pre-Christian, 
and is always depicted as a goat's horn out of which spills fruit, vegetables, and flowers. Here, the amphora, I think, is the symbol for that horn of plenitude. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe Barbara here will correct me. <laughs> and here we have one of the four seasons. This is spring. Uh, personifications of the earth in the four seasons are very common in the Byzantine art of Arabia. Traditionally, each season holds a different element of floral produce. Spring bears flowers, here roses. Summer wheat, autumn fruits, and winter olives. It's representing all the seasons. And this is what happens on a cold morning in December 1993. The excavations were going on. The archaeologists come across this bird mass. They can figure out what it is. And one of the foreman screams, there is writing, and everything just stops. And then everything goes down to using little brushes and trying to remove as much as possible. These were carbonized papyri. And I can talk for hours just about what happened that day and later. But in brief, the room was divided into sectors. Every sector was excavated, removed basically, the material was removed separately and was put into boxes. And the boxes were then transferred to the acre facilities uh, where the papyri were stored and eventually they were uh, conserved. In some cases, some of the papyri actually were found individually. Here we have an individual papyrus, but in most cases, that uh, was not stored. Also, many of the papyri were crusted. There's a thick crust around this one. This was probably created during and after the fire as the debris and limited humidity in the subsequent years created this protective, this protective coat that secured the survival of the papyri. If this papyri had not been carbonized as a result of the fire of the church and the storage room where they were found, they would have never survived in their original condition. As I said earlier, papyri is a special material. Now, in most cases, when the text, the text, when the texts were found, were found in this particular condition. It's a bunch of charcoal. Now you can imagine here a nightmare one goes to separate and is trying to find what the individual pieces are and dealing and conserving them and then trying to read them. This to me looks more like a pile of burnt wood. As I said, it was an incredible thing that the foreman saw the writing and said in his writing. One of the most important things that I need to stress this about the Petra papyri is that they have, in my opinion, the best ever archaeological context. Most papyri that we have in collections worldwide are papyri that were purchased from dealers. Dealers bought them from farmers. Farmers will never tell them the source. So we have texts, we have large collections in Oxford, in Vienna, in Berlin, in Mi Michigan. But many of these texts don't have a context. We don't really know where they come from. Here, we have the best archaeological context ever. And not just knowing where, what building in they were found. We have really, literally, drawings of where each individual scroll was found. Remember, we created sectors and they were moving the In that process, many documents were cut in the middle. So for us, when we go back, we can actually use this map to see if two documents are joined together. It's a very important uh, piece of information. And of course, the physical context of large allows not only connections between the various fragments, but also connections with the immediate social and civic environment, the church itself, and the region at large. And this is what happens after the transfer to Acor. This is Professor Jakob Frozen from Finland and the Finnish Academy. He looks at this stuff. I wonder what he's thinking. I think he feels, whoa, what am I going to do with this? His team of about 10 people managed to unroll 150 rods. That's how much was salvaged from this room in a record time of nine months. This is unprecedented. You have to have lots of nerve, time, courage, and patience to deal with this material, to be able to unroll it. So congratulations to them. Actually, they are now part 
And there are two teams that they are editing at the Hira, and one is a Finnish team and the other Frozen. One is a Michigan team until recently directed by Professor Ludwig Cannon. In the last few years I've taken over the part of the project. Now, we have 150 roles, but in fact we probably have close to 100, if not more, texts because it was pretty standard in the ancient world not to waste paper. So, many of these texts actually have two documents. You write one document that expires, you don't throw the paper away, you turn it around and you write another document. Okay. And that's actually pretty tricky because as the papyri had been placed in glass, we had to find ways to read what's in the back. We had photographed them, we had photographs, but we can't always rely on the photographs. At any rate, 50 of these texts provided a lot of information with the process of preparing the third volume of text that will appear by the end of the year. I project another three at least. So, what are these texts about? These texts are about an extended family that spans almost over a period of 67, perhaps 80 years. The main character is Theodorus, son of Apollianus. He was born around 514 CE. He married his first cousin, Stephanus, daughter of Patrophilos, and we should not be surprised here because such close in marriages were not uncommon in the ancient world, and as I hear, they're not uncommon also in the modern world, marrying your first cousin. As a result of this marriage, many documents that once belonged to the father-in-law, Patrophilos, ended up in Theodorus' archive. Theodorus was a deacon and then the archdeacon. These archdeacons are actually the assistants very often of bishops. That's why we think that's an additional piece of information. This was really the secret vision of that um, He was the deacon, the archdeacon of the Church of the Papyri, and he probably lived to be over 80 years old. Incredible age, really, for that particular era. Many documents were written by legal experts. The equivalent of, well, not public letters the way we have them in the United States, but perhaps the way they exist in Greece, they're very important legal figures. These are the people who are the legal experts of the time. So many of these documents were written by these people, and the documents deal with possession, disposition, acquisition of real estate, and other types of property. They include sworn and unsworn contracts, settlements of dispute out of court, agreements of all sorts, loans, sales, divisions of property, registrations, marriages, inheritance, and of course, first and foremost, tax receipts. Many tax receipts. My favorite thing. So, with the discovery of the Petra Papyri, we have a complete revision of the history of Petra and of its region. First of all, the Papyri put an end to the myth that Petra did not exist 551. That's finished. We get very good information on the way the economy functions in the city and the area. And now we know that in fact the economy was based on agriculture. We know that the people of Petra did not live just to be themselves. We know that they had contacts with other communities in the area. One of them is Zadaka, for instance, a community that is located about 20 kilometers southeast of Petra. The people had contacts with cities as far as Gaza, the main character of the archive, Theodorus. We know he took a trip to Gaza. We know he signed a contract about property of his family that was there. We don't know the details, unfortunately, because the document is very fragmentary. But we also have information that people knew about the Theropolis, a city close to Jerusalem. Um, probably also the Pernod. Uh, and we'll probably find it even other cities as we keep reading and revising um, these texts. Another important piece of information that comes out of this text is that Petra was a fully integrated city within the Byzantine Empire. In fact, we have tangible information that legislation that was produced in Constantinople was put into application in Petra as fast as six months faster than Egypt. There is actually a very interesting case where the emperors 
excuse people from taxation. Well, they don't really excuse. They just say, because people pay taxes late, occasionally the members will come out and say, okay, well, if you have not paid taxes for the past 10 years, you can now pay with a reduction of one-fourth. And we do have that legislation mentioned in one of our texts, two years after it was produced. Very, very interesting. We have a very good sense about who these people were in the archive. This is top-notch elite families of Petra. These are people that have a lot of property, and we'll see that in just a few seconds. And their wealth is based both on land and gold. There is gold in the family. Um, I don't want to divert here, but in one of the texts, when Theodorus gets married, there are three documents that actually report this marriage, so they pay a lot of attention to the kids. There are scenarios. What happens if Stephanus dies? What happens if Theodorus dies? What happens if Patrophilus dies? What happens if their children die? What happens if the property? But in the final act of his agreement, Theodorus says, I don't want land. He had gotten land as part of his dowry. So he returns the land to his father-in-law, and instead he gets gold. And he gets six and a half pounds of gold. Now you say, that's a lot of gold, maybe it's a, very, it's a lot of gold, especially for Petra in the 6th century. But this gives you an idea of how much people really care about wealth, what wealth meant for them, land and gold. And this is a very major upper class family. Out of, I don't know how many people who sign in the contracts, only in one case, one person stays in his country. Everybody else writes in his own hand. This is amazing. If you compare this with nature, you don't find a power. And in fact, many of these people used very rare words in their vocabulary. Words that are influenced by literature. So they were reading. So, I mean, what I'm trying to say here is the myth about the isolation of Petra and all that. I don't know to what extent that's really true. We get a slightly different picture from this text. All right, time to turn to the main thing. This is the shaman papyrus before it was conserved. You can see here how much damage it was. The detail here. Okay, if this is the papyrus, imagine this is a roll. You might. Right. If this is a roll, imagine this is the outside, okay? Very often when rolls are rolled, the bottom of the text, the end of the text was inside. The beginning of the text was outside. The outside, of course, is the one part that gets more damage during the fire. The outside of the rock also contains things like the beginning. Always a dating formula by the way you enter a console. That has disappeared. The contracting parties, detailed information, that has disappeared. What we get is exactly the point where the agreement begins. So we have actually one third of the rock missing. But, after unrolling the text, the text, the raw, we actually got quite a bit of material here. You can see there are like five different segments. A, B, C, D, well, E. <laughs> and here you have to imagine that when this row is rolled, it's then flattened. So what you unroll, you can't unroll the entire row and destroy it. So it was Cut into segments A, B, C, D. Each segment was unrolled separately and then was put together. It's a nightmare. But it's a successful nightmare. We have a video So here we'll see counter layers are missing. Here we have one layer, here is missing. That's because that part was damaged. Okay? And also fragment C at the end of the roll are missing. Here, I would like to point out also, you don't have the same kind of contrast as here because this part was not carbonized as well. It's a different organization stage. And this is the end of the Shaman Papyrus. You can actually see the original in the exhibit. It's the last plate in the exhibit. This is a reconstruction through photo montage. Okay, and I have to tell you again about our work. When we work, we look at the original. We have photographs. We cut the photographs and we put the various fragments together. Right. Now, of course, since we have digital experts with us, and we can do this digitally, we do it digitally. 
that in 1995, I think we had Adobe Photoshop version 3, which I knew how to use, but we couldn't do as much as we can do today. At any rate, I would like to, I want to point out to you that we actually have quite a bit of text in the part which is inside the text. Uh, so, what is the Shaman Papyrus about? First of all, let me stress that this is probably one of the top three papyri in the archive in terms of the kind of information we can report to the First of all, it's the largest known division of property that we have from the ancient world. It's about 2 meters and 10, it's about 210 miles. We can't really calculate the exact length because so much is damaged, but 210 lines is a lot of text. We know that it's a division of property between three brothers, Passos, Epiphanios, and Sabinos, and they're all relatives of Theodorus, probably from the previous generation. The date, as I said, was in the beginning, it's lost. Based on internal evidence, we can more or less say that the document dates between 527 and 537 C. What's the property about? Well, the property that is reported contains vineyards, grain land, houses, apartments, agricultural facilities, and for slaves. And the property is located in three different areas. In a village called Cerilla, in an area called Obana, and in Petra itself. I will come back to this in a bit because there are some interesting things. As I said, these are the three places where the, the um, property is located. The landed property that is divided by the three brothers is really amazing. It's 140 yugera. Um, in Petra and its region, land was measured in this Roman measurement called the yugera. And there are different sizes, <coughs> but we, we, we think that we figure out which one was used in Petra. This equals to about 87 acres of land or 350. 2,000 square meters. Now, I have visited Petra five or six times. I just cannot imagine where so much land would be usable land would be located. But of course, we have to remember here that it's also land in Cyrilla and in Ogba. They also divide four slaves. Now, in terms of housing, apartments, and other agricultural um, appurtenances, they divide 20 apartments, 12 of which are in Petra and 9 in Cyrilla, a stable a sister, part of the farmhouse, three freshman floors with granaries, three down depositories, one large and one small dry garden in Cerilla, one large and five small dry gardens in Petra. One striking thing, no animals are born, are divided in this particular environment. I don't know why. Now, these descriptions, in particular of the houses and of the agricultural installations, provide a rather intimate look into the appearances of both villages and Petra itself in this period, for which little is known from the archaeological record. Unfortunately, and I have to say this, archaeologists tend to focus on large monuments rather than domestic space. The apartments are parts of extended structural complexes called oikoi, uh, all are located on the top level. Along with them come bed chambers, apartment and courtyard entrances, small and large courtyards, stairs and balconies, vestibules, door lifts, and in one case even a small tower. Now, gardens in Petra? Come on, you must be joking. Well, not really. The Shona Papyrus mentions several gardens in Petra. Um, and this, in my opinion, is an echo of an earlier period the Nabatinian tradition of beautiful public gardens, and you probably all know that a large garden complex was discovered recently next to the ground of the Great Temple of Salvation by Ian Bedal. This is not the best slide I have, but this representation of the island with a building in the middle and the pool um, that was found next to the Great Temple. Here I have a representation, artistic representation by Chris Canelopoulos to give you an idea of how Petra probably looked in the Nabatean period. It's really incredible, the colors and the entire space, and it's just 
breathtaking we can really see the bull and the public garden that existed there. This is a great temple. Okay. I'm going to give some examples of descriptions of property so that you, know, you get a sense of how this is described in the document. So here's an example of land description. From the place called Math Lela, Langeur, under leased by Athonius, neighbors. On the east, heirs of Ithenius. On the west and south, Ithenius. On the north, Bassus, both brothers. So you can see here how much of this property actually was within the family. You know, you have brother on one side, brother on the other side. You know. We have fragmentation of property from generation to generation in terms of the plots are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, an interesting point here is that I was talking with Tom Parker about that yesterday. This particular plot of land is under lease, right? Then Tom said, so what is the nature of these farmers? We can't really tell because the papyri don't tell us. They just say the lessee is X person or the tenant is X person. Are these serfs, are these people tied down to the land? We really don't know. We have no tangible evidence to suggest that. So we probably don't have the kind of scheme of things we have in Egypt or in the West where we have a A description of a divided house. The upper story apartment, Eliav Alepus, situated above the unit of the heirs of most blessed Ephemius, with its terrace and height and air and entrance and exit and every right. And you can see here the legal language kicking in, right? Not just this apartment, but with its terrace, height and air and entrance and exit and every right. Every right is like a general word. In case we have forgotten something, let's put this in. Every right. Um, interesting parts here, the height and the air. The air is what is above this apartment. Um, in fact, people like today could build. However, there was imperial legislation from time to time that prohibited building on the air because if you do that, you basically block the view of the neighbor. Right? So, the kind of thing we see today is happening in Great Britain is what Description of divided housing with restricted rights of use. The unit outside of the villa that faces south into the street and is located above the unit that had been a prenuptial gift and that passes, most pious brother, received by lot. And in addition, that the said Sabinos made no use of this unit except for its entrance and exit only. Here you can say, you can see that we have all these restrictions. It's a very carefully, extremely carefully crafted document. It's, just, it's breathtaking. And probably the implication is that there is an outside staircase, and that's what you can use, but nothing else. And finally, descriptors of appurtenances. Here we have references to a freshman floor and its granary according to the fixed boundaries. What is this according to the fixed boundaries? Well, you know, we saw that they actually define borders and things, but very often people predetermine boundaries, so they don't really have they do them in separate documents, or they agree between them orally, or there are fixed boundaries like rocks, torrents, buildings. These are predetermined boundaries fixed boundaries. Here's the dung heap again, the dung pit behind the bedroom by Talat Bar. So what is this dung pit? I'll come back to that in a second. Is this a toilet? Or is this something else? And finally, the other eastern third part of the dry garden, dry garden according to the fixed boundaries. A dry garden, what is a dry garden? Very important, it comes all over the place is a garden that bears trees and fruit that are drought tolerant and do not require water. These gardens probably served mostly to cut carry for purposes and were not planted chiefly for pleasure like the large paradiso, so like the big public garden we have. But they echo that notion of garden. Um, dry gardens are always situated next to buildings in a civic environment. You don't find them anywhere else. It's always by um, a little footnote here. When we first found this word in the Shaman papyrus, we are Israel Khan said, What's happening here? The only other part of the we could find 
is in a piece of Greek literature from the 7th century AD. One reference, only one. And then as we started digging and digging and digging, we found in all sorts of strange, obscure pieces of manuscripts that describe monastic property and stuff like that. So it took a lot of search and research to be able to come to grips with what this term is. The Shaman Papyrus provides unique insights into how the scribe and probably the three brothers perceived, conceptualized, and embraced and placed themselves within the local landscape. That is to say, the document provides a very specific type of narrative of the ecological space and social landscape of the area of colors. The document follows a very fixed way of describing the three brothers' property. The description of their lots always begins with property in the village of Serila, moves to Lokbala, and then finally to Petra. In two cases, the scribe reveals his own physical position and presence when he describes property as being in this very metropolis. So basically the scribe is there. I would like to argue that this narrative strategy suggests that the scribe perceives Petra as the center and Cyrilla as the periphery of this landscape, making it likely that Cyrilla was the most distant area, whereas Ogbana was a transitory zone between Petra. So center and periphery. A periphery that is sort of not easy to describe. Orientation in space, so this is a very interesting um, bit. The land we saw, right, is always described with fixed cardinal definitions, east, west, south, north, uh, in the Shaman Papyrus, but also in all the surviving documents from the Near East. The first pair, the east, west, represents the course of the eternally rising sun. This is how people would find their way in less familiar space, where there were no fixed landmarks or technological devices to help people orient themselves. These fixed cardinal definitions have no religious background, in my opinion, since they are recorded in use in the Near East before the rise of Christianity. And I'd like to stress this because of our concept of churches are always oriented towards the East, right? East, West. Uh, and that Christians are always buried facing East. If we switch this paradigm, uh, Muslims like here are always buried facing Mecca, right? But here, in this papyri, I don't think there is any religious element. I think this is a very old tradition. This is how people really understood their space. This is how they would find their way through the fields and back home. Now, when we look at the way uh, buildings are described, this paradigm shifts slightly. The descriptions become looser. Instead of east-west, the descriptions give what is above, below, or behind the building, as we saw earlier. It is as if the writer and the three brothers are physically there, facing the buildings and moving through and around them. All in all, the descriptions of land and houses given in this document are based on human experience and activity. In other words, the descriptions are very much based on how people felt the space, how they lived in it, and how they experienced it. Okay, question here. When you went to school, how were you taught to figure out East and West? You probably were asked to stand up, face East, right? So in front of you was East, behind you was West, etc., etc., etc. I think this is very much a body face experience of space, and this is exactly what was happening also in the spirit. This is how people sense their space, this is how they move around. All right, what is the name? One of the most important things, element of the shaman papyrus, is the fact that names, that plots of land have names, agricultural complexes have names, houses have names, apartments have names, and also some of the individuals have names that are Arabic, or sometimes are translations of Arabic. I am not really the expert on this topic, I will give you some few examples, but the expert is in here last night. That's Dr. Ramal al from the Arab University. And in fact, he brought with him tonight proofs of all the Arabic names, right? That come from inventory from the Shaman Papyrus. 
here to see if you'd like to consult at the end. This is a very interesting topic. And it is very interesting, you know why? Because here we have an opportunity to see how Arabic was actually verbalized, pronounced in this period. Before it, we would have a systematic Arabic script. I must say, that, of course, that the names we get here are a combination of the Batia and Aramaic and their Arabic. It's, this is very, very hard. So, let me give you some examples. And I can put them down in Greek and then in transliteration and then in translation. So, Arabic names of areas of land. An area called Matlela, in Arabic, Matlela, and in translation this would mean the track of land. Math of a woman called Lela. Another example, an area that is called Al Sulam. Sulam means step or stair, preferring probably to cultivate terraces. Now we'll come back to this second. An area called Al Sira, which is an enclosure for animals, specifically for cattle. And then we have a dry garden, garden, Ganat, is that the art of the word for the garden too, right? Ganat right? Al Salam. The Garden of Peace. If, unless you've changed that already, I don't know. Well, the end is not linear, I think. So it's the Garden of the so and so, Sarah. I see. So you can see here that this is changing as we talk. <laughs> that's, what, that's, how, that's what happened with research. So that is still living in Petros, really. Right. <laughs> well, many, many actually of the companies. We think that some of them actually we have been able to identify, although I'm not too hot on that. Names of the importers, Darat, not Darat al Fanun, but Darat al Ibad, the great farmhouse of the servants, if that's still uh, common. Darat, as probably modern times, has the meaning of a complex of buildings, often encompassed at least partially by a wall with a courtyard or open space. Another one we have is Bai al Akbar. Uh, the house of the associates, perhaps the religious associates, that's something you really don't know. Personal names. The archives owner, last owner, Theodora, son of Opo Diana. So the Dianos, of course, is the Hellenized form of um, the Nabataean king Obadiah, so the name derives from that. Another one is called Busarios, from Nabataean deity Bushara. And most names that will actually have sound creep around that in fact may be translation of local names. So we have the guy Bassus, one of the brothers that appears in the division of the Shaman the Pyros. That might come from the Arabic word Pus, which means cat. Or Leontius may be a translation of the Arabic Asad, lion. Okay. What is it that we faced when we did this work on the Shaman? First of all, we had to shift around and replace about 500 fragments. Some of them had two or three letters. As I said before, the exact date in the beginning is missing, and we had to calculate that based on each other's criteria. Very often, we had problems understanding vocabulary and descriptions. Here, I'll give you some examples. What is a coprothesion? It's a dung heap, and why is it always near houses? Okay, this word appears also in one other papyrus that is being studied by the Finnish team. The Finnish team in the beginning thought this is a toy. I insist it was not a toy. It's actually a very important agricultural installation. The Dunkhi, it was a pile that received animal refuse, but also acted as a compost pile. And in fact, we have found ancient information, ancient sources that talk about heaps and how the process of composting acts works, what you put in there, and how then at the end, after uh, several months or years, you use this material as fertilizer in the fields. Um, what do you do with a, trans with a trans description like this? A piece of land which is from the place al Gazazes, what is below Math al-Luza, one good girl. What is the meaning of below Math al-Luza? Well, it's this. It's their agriculture. So it was, we, we had a hard time actually understanding why this part of the land describes it below. Well, it's below this particular land, which is called something else. Okay. 
And then we have all these contorted descriptions when they divide houses, especially <coughs> houses in a civic environment where the houses are complex <coughs> and divide already many times. Now let me give you an example here. Now, make sense out of this. The small upper story apartment close to them with their terraces, height, air and entrance, and exit through the Paris Dumbos. They said well the complex is side door that opens to the east, so that the sets of Venus may block their present entrance from the lost inner doorpost of the mentioned small upper story apartment to the corners of its vestibule and block likewise the existing door of the said upper story apartment and not offer himself a door to the east towards the mentioned roofless upper story apartment at his own labor and expense. Um, we have sort of figured this out, but it took us years before we could understand what we wanted. And this is, this is the kind of thing that actually requires close cooperation between archaeologists and us. Archaeologists have the remains. They see the houses. They, they see entrances, exits, vestibules, things like that. We have the vocabulary. But attaching the vocabulary to the particular parts of the building is the hardest part. And then figuring out what exactly we're doing is the next stage. Okay, to sum up. So what is the importance of the Shoman Papyrus? First of all, the Shoman Papyrus provides a unique insight into the physical, ecological, civic, and architectural environment of Petra and the surrounding area. It shows that Petra's economy was based largely on the production of grain and vines. Archaeological evidence corroborates this since several presses have been found, used probably also for the production of oil. But the papyri, strangely enough, do not mention any olive trees. The local elites, like their Roman counterparts, invested in land and housing, not in long-distance trade, which is completely absent from the Petra papyri. The amount of property owned by the local elites that comes out through the Shaman papyrus is just uh, incredible. The family of the three brothers clearly belongs to the upper strata of Petra society. Another element we saw was the way people sense their environment and living space through their living experience and their movement through this particular space. The Shaman papyrus that we saw provides a unique snapshot of Petra's cultural profile. Although people used Greek for writing documents and for their administrative transactions, they nevertheless remain very much attached to their local culture and traditions. This is something that is confirmed by several other documents, and I didn't want to get really too much involved into that because there is a lot here uh, that this would be a separate, really a separate language. And most importantly, the Shaman Papyrus is one of the most, really, literally, the three most important texts in the archive for writing Petra's history in the 6th century, for which, until the discovery of these texts, we had to the pages. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer questions if you have. Because, I mean, this is only a tiny bit of information. So, you get a sense here of how people move through this land, how they measure it, and they probably move from one plot to the next plot to the next plot. And this is a very interesting document in terms of even now the neighbors, for instance, right? Or how Euclid the family was, or how concentrated the property was, and how fragmented it became for successive generations. Most of the neighbors are probably in the same <laughs> of course, we have Robert Chicken here too, and so I can be very careful what I'm saying. But I have the impression here we have a family that comes from Petra's upper class. A family that traditionally has been involved in agriculture. A family that invests in land 
both. This, I think there is another world outside of Petra, whatever Petra was in this period. We still have nomadic tribes. We still have people that are involved in that. But there seems to be no, and if there is contact between the several populations of the nomads, for some reason this is not in the We have no records of it. But I do believe that, I mean, how do these people survive? On grain and wine and grapes? There must be something else out there that brings their fish and their meat and their milk and all that. But these are the people that are probably outside of the city environment. They interact, but somehow that interaction is not reported in the text. That's my feeling. Well, I'm glad you said that, because um, I think, while never denying the importance of this find, there's a danger, I think, in becoming too myopic about this find. This is the archive of one family in a large city. And so, somebody brought the marble to Petra, somebody brought the incense they were undoubtedly burning in the church, somebody brought the imported fineware, somebody brought the Aqaba amphorae to the site and so forth. So, so there has to be extensive trade in Petra. Now, was Petra still an international center of long-range trade, trade, of long-distance trade? I think that's a separate question. I also have one other question for you. Can I, can I respond to uh, Yes, please, please. I don't deny what you're saying. In fact, what is interesting that comes out of this archive is that if you have a family that thinks exclusively about the culture, a family that thinks in land, that thinks exclusively with that, right, and its products, there's a clear division here of activities yes. and activities, which is very interesting. It, it is, it is. That is very interesting. Um, and then the other thing that I, uh, obviously, you know, you made the point, the most important, I think, results of this line is to show that the history of Petra as a vigorous urban center uh, extends to the, at least to the end of the 6th century. And uh, the church is then presumably destroyed in the early 7th century, at the very end of the 6th century. But I'm also glad Robert Schick is here because, um, and, and, I'm, and I'm predicted of this field, but my understanding is that Petra is never mentioned in any account of the Muslim conquest. And it's absent in early Arabic sources, early Muslim sources. And so, if you're going to take, if you're going to take Petra's history up to uh, 600. Again, the problem there is, does he appear in a military function or in a private function? He was an important man. He didn't have to be always in his military function, right? We don't know. We know that whatever he told people to do at some stage, to resolve or dispute, they ignored him. <laughs> <laughs> I, seriously, what we have in the King's Scroll, so to speak, um, is the final act of a dispute that incorporates two preceding phases of the same dispute. So you have two incorporated documents in the final act, which constitutes the third document. That text is how many lines long? 600 lines? The longest known dispute out of war in the ancient world. And the filler intervenes in the second phase. He tells them to pull out some vines and things, and they never do that. So, and I mean, the, the whole issue of the Arab allied tribes is very tricky. But isn't it also true that Petra, at some stage, ceases to be the capital of the third Palestine? We were talking about that yesterday, yeah. right? Those two and what exactly is this happening? I don't know. Unfortunately, as I told you, the standard way of preserving this text was to have the end of the document raw inside, the outside was always exposed to the elements. So many of these documents don't have a beginning. You have the middle and the end. But it's in the beginning where you get the title of Petra and the description of Petra as capital of Third Palestine, Salatares, Salataria. 
for many of these late documents, that part is missing. We don't have it. I'm going to start looking for it now somewhere. You know, I might find some traces. So if the title Metropolis is missing, that might be an indication that indeed this happens, and we might be able to establish one exactly and take it from there. But this is why it's important actually to look at the wider historical picture and then return to the documents and look at the documents again with a fresh mind, with a fresh eye, because this text will give you only that much, and you're right. We should not be myopic and say, this is the history of Petra, this is the history of the region. What I said is that it gives us insights into local history through the lens of an upper class family. In terms of bias, oh, it's totally bias. Absolutely. Yes? Um, going, kind of going back to the very just talking about in terms of Petra's demise, whatever. <laughs> um, I've just been in the last week or so going through kind of trying to fit up Northridge stratigraphy with the stratigraphy in the Petra Church. And what really struck me today is I'm talking about sort of the post fire, um, you know. The occupation of the Petra Church is in a period of like 50 to 75 years, based on ceramic and point evidence. You have all these structures kind of becoming essentially either falling apart like the Petra Church or getting cleared out, and you have people sort of squatting in them informally. And that's always struck me as sort of not necessarily the demise of Petra, but maybe the demise of Petra's ecclesiastical importance because. We don't really know what's going on in other parts of the site. Or the demise of the city center. Yeah, exactly. I don't think that ever yeah. reminded me, and I'm not that serious at all, I don't think that Petra was ever serious. Mm -hmm. Whatever oh, we that, we don't know what we would call Petra. I mean, Petra is a much larger entity. It's not just the city center mm -hmm. where the city is mm -hmm. right, right? And this is where I believe that we really have to start expanding excavations mm -hmm. in the city get into the residential area or areas that have not been disturbed as much and sample and see where we can come up with because there are so many intriguing questions in there. I think we have a colleague, uh, her name is Maria. Maria, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I talked to Maria about that last year. <laughs> And, and draw the map of Palestine. What did he say about the Arabs? Because we know that the Nabataeans were Arabs, and they inhabited this place and they created this culture. So where, where, where I'm are they in your? Okay. 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 There are many more experts here in terms of history of Arab tribes and Arabs and yeah. what big authorities have said. Anybody would like to comment on this? I can comment on this too. Um, he really wasn't particularly, particularly interested in that per se. A lot of what he was writing was um, he was observing routes that had been documented by Arab history. So he, he traveled routes from Palestine, from from Bakra, from Shoba, from Bayan, uh, retracing those routes in and through Petra and describing them very carefully. He wasn't actually particularly documenting Petra per se as, a, as an archaeologist. And so he's really looking at different sets of questions. I think he was more of an ethnographer right. and archaeologist. Yeah, but the He's very interested in, in recording the songs that people were singing, the poetry, and their and and their lifestyle. But he made very accurate for the time site plans and listened carefully to the location of sites. When I have a conflict about where an ancient site was, he's the one who usually gets it right. He's amazing. And other travelers often get it wrong as to where sites exactly are, what their names are, and so forth. 
Well, well, maybe this is true about this book, uh, the Arab Royal, uh, but uh, about Petra, I don't know because we don't know anything about it. And I tried even to trace out uh, something, a summary or something of it, of even the introduction. Uh, it was very difficult because the language was difficult, and even for translators, it was difficult because it needed a, a very accurate translator and very specialized translator. This so, is I, 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 he was this a chef. Uh, actually, this is a chef writing. I wish German. this book would be translated by Dean Kang. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. Thank you very much. I just wanted to mention that the, in the early Islamic period, the principal settlement in the area is that both were no longer credit. Both was mentioned often enough in the early Islamic period. Mm -hmm. And so, for some reason, that is the settlement that's the principal. Right. Right. It right. is that Augustopolis or. Right. Well, we think it's Augustopolis, but uh, here, for instance, it's not Augustopolis. And I don't really want to get into fights here as to where things were without really having great tangible evidence. Linguistically, we cannot prove it was Augustopolis because Augustopolis is a whole tree, we can't really make a connection. Really, linguistically. Unless, as I said, some places actually got different names in the Arab world. This is not unheard of, I'm sure. Places change names. And, and I'm thinking of the loud here. Um, I don't have an answer to that for Augustopolis and Petra at some stage shared the cadastro. That is, records of property that belonged to Augustopolis were filed in Petra. And then later on, property in Petra was brought in Augustopolis. But this might be really these gray zones where properties really done are sort of on the border between the two and the administrative units. It's very hard to tell. But we do have very close cooperation here, administrative cooperation between our stories. And we get this from really the tax dollars, all these transfers of property. But one of the things that I found to be really striking, and I didn't really talk about this because it's not really part of the shaman requires is that these upper class people of Petra felt very cosmopolitan. Yeah, they traveled they could because you don't see that happening all the time, how this this once you know it's recorded. But they feel cosmopolitan in the way they perceive themselves through their names. <coughs> they are not Greek sounding, Roman sounding names. Um, they keep an eye on what happens in Costa Law changes, the emperor we mentioned at the beginning of the document, six months later it's applied, it's done. Egypt, it's a year later. The law comes out about the Tetratem Maria, Maria, whatever it's called, the one fourth of the tax is excused. Two years later, you see it in the documents, it's mentioned. And also the people of the Petra. Of, of and there's something here that I should tell you because. This is new, 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 it's not published yet, it's not published. We thought, when we found the pilot, we were actually amazed that Petra has this long titulature. Augusta Colonia, Mother of Colonies, etc., etc., etc. Well, during the Brown excavations, one of the students, Sarah Wright Katz, Cars really was excavating the small, what's called the small temple? Yes, yeah, the small temple to just to the west of the great temple. So it's, it's a temple that is probably connected with imperial culture. And she found all these endless fragments of inscriptions. Some of these inscriptions I had looked, I really didn't have enough time to work on them because the fire the fire I, I left them. Sarah went back to finish her dissertation, John but I looked at them made a tra draft transcription. Last summer I asked, do you have a draft? I looked at the text, I looked at the description that are partly constructed. And I just looked at it. These are inscriptions from 225. 400 years ago, you see the entire 
take the picture of the convention. The way we get to the papyrus, maybe one exception. I think the other is not really a problem, but anyway, it's all there. Somebody was recording reading the history. Somebody remembered all the titles that were bestowed on the city in their own period for years. For me, this is just mind blowing. Well, I thought what we have in the text, the papyri, isn't it? And again, showing the romanization process of the city, remembering history, but still very long, you know, being very long. But at the same time, cosmopolitan, looking out into the empire, seeing what's happening there. Then, 400 years of history is still there in the middle of the 6th century. Anyway, we hope that we'll be able to revise this inscription, publish them before, because this is really very important. Probably. Anyway. This is new, I mean, this is not out yet, it's not published, that's, but it's really fascinating. One last comment. Gaza, the relationship with Gaza is established during the Vatican period. It was a great relationship between those of you see it in the map. Mm -hmm. Gaza is much closer than uh, even Aqaba because that were the trade. Depending on what crowd you follow. Exactly, so the right. center of yeah. consumers. <laughs> One of our former collaborators, he's not working with the project anymore, but he thought he could find, um, I don't know if he's researching this, he thinks that he can identify perhaps the relative of the Odara son of the in Gaza. <laughs> so if this happens, if this is true, and he can show this, then it's possible. This man was a famous doctor. There might be a family connection there, again, upper class connection. But if uh, Bob manages to prove this, he's working on it. It would be a real revolution here. <laughs> I mean, this is just connecting this particular family with known historical entities. Well, we still. We have to keep digging into the papyri and to the sites to find more stuff. It's endless. People say, when are you going to finish? <laughs> <laughs> there is no end to these things. It's part of research. Research never ends. There is a beginning and middle that never end. <laughs> Where in the middle? <laughs> well, Acorn will keep coming back, so. <laughs>